Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Go Big or Go Home. I am old man Troy, joined by the cookie monster, Kevin Cunningham, a.k.a. <laughs> funny on Twitter. What's going on today, my friend? I'm oh, just eating some cookies, Troy. Just eating some cookies. That's, that's what I was doing before the show started. I was beep, 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 beep. And Troy was like, what, what's going on in the background there, youngster? And I was like, well, I'm just warming up some cookies before the show. You know, getting the chocolate chips a little, a little, uh, a little, I, I can't think of the word gooey, I guess. I, I was thinking of some different word, but same Whatever concept. special food you need <laughs> to have your supreme powers. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's okay. fine. But uh, did you have cookies last week before the show? Just, just I did wondering. Not. No, See, I didn't. So we have to get on this show today. This is the first time ever that we actually have to admit we were wrong. Our lock of the week was wrong. Yeah. We literally got obliviated. It looked good <laughs> at first. First drive, Northwestern scores touchdown. Woo! Right. And then what happened? They get abducted by aliens? It's like they want to play football against Duke. I don't know. Maybe the cookies are the special power. Well, maybe we'll get back on the winning track this week if we have any games we agree on. You know what, Kevin? A couple of interesting games in the Big Ten, but, I mean, it, it's early season college football in my mind. You know, as I scour not even the Big Ten, but every conference, it's like, oh, what's really going on? I mean, if we have, have time, I know we've got some time constraints, even though we normally don't on Go Big or Go Home. But Penn, I mean, we're going to talk about Penn State and Pitt. And I might want to gear it toward Pitt a little bit and get your thoughts if we have time. So let's save that recap game till the last, if you can. Uh, okay. Normally how we do this, for those that are new listeners, the youngster is going to go down the games. I'm going to chime in as I normally do, interrupt him and, uh, and annoy the heck out of him by doing it. But that's what he does. He goes through, recaps the games. We talk about them. He throws some questions my way once in a while. Then we're going to look forward and we're going to preview the next week. Week three already in college football, youngster. Week three. Where, where did it go? It's just like yesterday. It's like, ooh, college football is here. Now it's already week three. We're rolling right along. And then as we're previewing next week, if the youngster and I agree against the spread on any games, we'll lock it in. And last week, we lost our first one, youngster. But take it away. Let's get into recapping week two of the Big Ten. Yeah, people also might be thinking like, oh, gee, wow, you lost your first game. You know, that, that's pretty crazy. It, it's only week two. So what are you bragging about? Last year, when we did this, we started at like halfway through the year, so we only did like five or six of these. But we hit on every single one against the spread involving a Big Ten team. So we well, were you have to remember, too, youngster, we both have to agree. That's the lock. I yeah. mean, I've been wrong. I mean, right. I've been wrong before because I want to lock something in or you want to lock something in, but I don't want to lock something right. in. It has to be a mutual agreement between the youngster and the old man for it to be a go big lock. So there's a lot of times where I lock something. Heck, week one I locked a couple things and lost. Yeah. So, uh, but as a as as a duo, as a tandem, first time we've lost doing this show. Kind kind of sad, but we'll get back yeah, to the winning track next week. I feel pretty good about that. Considering that we do monopoly money on these bets, I mean we we give them out to the listeners by obviously talking about it, but posting it on social media and talking about it in like the little preview to the show on thegruelingtruth.net. Uh, I, I felt really bad about that Northwestern game not working out. Uh, I, I don't know why. Again, it, it's Monopoly money. Um, but I, I felt terrible <laughs> about it. As it was happening, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And realistically, it's like, what did I lose? Absolutely nothing. But in any case, We'll move on to the top 25 very quickly. Um, Alabama 1, Clemson 2, Georgia 3, nothing's changed there. Ohio State 4, nothing's changed there. Something I wanted to bring up, um, I already feel like I know your, what your answer is going to be, Troy, but Wisconsin started the year at number four. They won a game. They went back to number five. They won a game in week two. Now they're back to number six. So they keep winning. They keep dropping. Um, it, it, in the early portion of the year like this, it, these teams, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State, Oklahoma, just jumped Wisconsin. It's a matter of did you 
beat down your little piss poor college in week one, week two, better than the team behind you? If so, then you'll move up a spot. I mean, that, that's basically what it is to me. Um, but Wisconsin keeps winning, keeps moving back. Uh, and I know to you, Troy, you think Wisconsin's probably a back-end top 10 team anyway. Um, so, I, I don't know. Your thoughts on Wisconsin? I will say too. this, though, Kevin. Early in the season like this, unless you're playing in another top 25 team yeah, or s- somebody that's maybe in the top 50, you shouldn't vote somebody because you won by more. I, I don't like that. We mentioned mm-hmm. last week, and I'll say this, I, I guess I've been in the coaching realm, and to run up scores for statistics and for rankings, I don't agree with it. I know, I know why it's there. I know that's the reality of how things work. But when it comes down to it, we thought Paul Chris would save Jonathan Taylor. He ran him, what, 33 times, I think, so, somewhere around there, in the 30s. Yeah, 33. And maybe it was – Maybe it was because Paul Chris wants to, to maintain his ranking. And, see, I don't like that. That gets away from everything he's done. And being a Badger fan, Paul Chris is that guy that will normally, when the game's in hand, he'll let some other guys have a chance. How do you think Jonathan Taylor came to be last year, Kevin? Taylor didn't start the year as the starting tailback. He started doing well in mop-up roles against these cupcakes and it's like, holy crap, what do we have here? What, what do we have in this kid? So I, I think what it does is it forces some of these colleges to try, like you said, put a beat down on a, on a lesser opponent, and I don't agree with it. I've been on the both ends as a coach where I've been complete control. And soccer, oh, I mean, gosh, youngster, there's games, and there's some games I remember playing, and it's like, Man, I can't tell my kids not to shoot. I can't tell my kids not to attack. I'm playing my second string, and I'm still scoring goals. This is terrible. I don't know what to do. And I I felt bad for the other team. And I learned early in my coaching days, especially in soccer, like some people will attack, and then they won't shoot, and they'll just start passing the ball around. That's actually, to me, uh, kind of more like rubbing it in your face. Yeah, I was like, going to say. <laughs> like, uh, look, we can get down here. We could score if we want to, but we're not going to, so we're just going to keep passing it around. So imagine, I, I driving, more... imagine driving down, getting it to, you know, first and 10 on your opponent's 13, and then running backwards for 30 yards and saying, all right, yeah. let's, you know, challenge ourselves. And, you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of what that would entail to me. I, I know it's a football show, but, I, you know, I love, I love sharing stories. I'm not sure if the listeners like them. I know you like them. So I remember I, I was coaching high school soccer, and we were playing a first-year team. It was a club team. And we were winning, Kevin, I think, 8 nothing at halftime. And, you know, in soccer, that's a lot of points in soccer. And the other team, I think, got the ball over half like two or three times just because they cleared the ball. It wasn't because they attacked one possession and went on attack to try and score. So at halftime, what I did is I didn't didn't want to embarrass the other team, right? And I don't want to tell my kids, well, you can't shoot, you can't score. But I actually told my kids that we are going to work on some things. And so when we get the ball, I do want you to circle it back to the sweeper, and I want you to start the ball from the back if we win the ball at midfield. Now, if we win it in their half of the field, you know, just attack. But I also told the girls, I said, you might think you're having fun by running up a score, but remember, it happened to us last year. And you should have saw the look in the girls' faces, Kevin, because they remembered when we got beat down 12 nothing right. against one of the best teams in the state. And that changed their attitude real quick. And they still went on and played. But we, I told them I wanted to work on some things. I want to work on switching the ball. I want to work on diagonal runs. So we actually went through, and they could still shoot. I mean, I think we scored another two goals in the second half because, like I said, Kevin, you can't just not shoot. That would be too embarrassing. But as a coach, there's certain things you can work on, and 
like get away from your game plan, like your normal game plan. So almost turned it into a practice. And that's what I did. We still scored. But, man, I'll, I'll tell you what, Kevin, I know in football, like you said, you, you cannot, like, give up and you can't just say, well, here's the ball back and well, we're beating you 60 to nothing. But there are some things that you can do to limit how fast you're scoring and what yeah. you're doing and get away from your game plan. I just don't like seeing all these scores get run up in college football, Kevin. Uh, I don't because I've been on both sides as a player, as a coach, and, you know, that's what the cupcake games are. And then all of a sudden, a team gets rewarded for winning 70 to nothing. Where Wisconsin gives up, what, 14 points, 45 to 14, and they're going to they're gonna get penalized. They still won. You know, why should they be penalized? No, but, you know, that's just me. Carry on. Yeah, no, I, there's actually the most dominant team that I cover in Wisconsin. I freelance right high school sports in Wisconsin still for three different high schools. And I do it remotely. Obviously I'm down in Florida now, but there's a boys soccer team that I think one state three years ago, one state five years ago took second in state the last two years. I mean, basically four fifths of their games are eight, nothing, nine, one, 11, nothing, uh, six, nothing. When they play a good team, it's like, Oh wow. We only won two to nothing. You know, it, it's like absurd, <laughs> but it's it's always interesting talking to the coach and, you know, trying to understand like, hey, you know, another 8-1 win. Hey, another 9-1 win. You know, it, it's almost like, what do you talk about? You know, until you play one of the top 10 teams in the state, it's just not even really going to be that close. <laughs> so it, it's interesting um, to me with, you know, there are a number of different ways that teams can go, obviously. And when you're just that much more dominant than everyone else, it's it's interesting to figure out what coaches work on and how they use subs and, you know, just all that stuff. But anyway, I'll move on to the top 25. Um, like I mentioned, Wisconsin's at six. I'll just mention the Big Ten teams from here on out. Penn State's at 11. They were 13. They beat the crap out of Pitt. Um, now they're up to 11. Michigan beat the crap out of Western Michigan. They were 21 a week ago. Now they're 19. Michigan State, I did not stay up until, you know, 4.42 in the morning or whatever it was that it ended since they started at 10.45 Eastern time. Um, they traveled to Arizona State. They were up 13-3, to I believe, going into the fourth quarter, and then they lost the fourth quarter uh, 13 nothing. They lost the game, I think it was 16-13. Um, that was unfortunate for Michigan State. But so they dropped all the way down from 15 to number 25. Um, And the only teams receiving votes outside of those five are Maryland and Iowa because Northwestern uh, was receiving votes a week ago, but they lost to Duke 21 to 7. So again, our first go big, go home lock of the week uh, over the last two seasons has lost. So sorry if anyone put actual money on that. Um, But, you know, historically, I guess you have won a lot of money if you put money on every single go big or go home lock of the week. But that's the top 25. Um, Still five teams in the top 25. I I guess nothing's really changed there. Um, Ohio State, Wisconsin are certainly up there. Penn State's around. Um, And then Michigan and Michigan State just kind of somewhat trying to find themselves and get into – I think being 10-win teams, I think if either of those turn into 10-win teams, then it's a successful year. But we've talked about schedules and how they're not even. But anyway, that's the top 25. Ohio State 4, Wisconsin 6, Penn State 11, Michigan 19, Michigan State 25. Um, Two things I wanted to note, too, as well, before we get into recapping games and then previewing for week three. Uh, Minnesota running back Rodney Smith, um, they I really wanted to take. Minnesota to cover the spread against Fresno State. I think they were three-point favorites a week ago. Um, Let me see here. Yes, they were three-point favorites, and they won by seven. So I was pissed at myself for not uh, not locking that in. I don't know if Troy would have as well. But in any case, uh, Rodney Smith, their top running back, fifth-year senior. Just an FYI, I wouldn't have locked it. Okay. Never mind, then. I'm not pissed at myself. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that would have been yours. I, I like Fresno State. They're a good team. They're they're a good team. I mean, they they traveled to Minnesota. We talked about the trap we talked about on the show last week. Fresno State, I wouldn't have been surprised if they could have pulled off that that 
so-called upset over over Minnesota. But right. uh, that that's a good team. I mean, they're, you're not going to – but Fresno State, I mean, you think of Fresno State, you, you're not thinking football. But they've got a good football team, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, they're they're always competitive. Um, I just really liked how Minnesota looked week one, so I was really looking to take them week two. Um, I didn't, obviously. But in any case, uh, the big news. Rodney Smith, their top running back, fifth-year senior, out for the year with a knee injury. Uh, that sucks. I mean, that, that's all I <laughs> said on Twitter about it. I retweeted and put my little, you know, caption on top of it, and I said, that sucks. You know, because it does. Um, that that's that was Minnesota's workhorse. That's what P.J. Fleck was going to, and boom, done out for the year with an injury. Uh, that's going to hurt Minnesota for sure. Uh, again, like I mentioned a week ago, I didn't expect Minnesota to compete with Ohio State, Wisconsin, Penn State, Michigan State, even Michigan. Um, but I thought they were probably of that next tier where it's like if Minnesota pulled off an upset or two, yeah, they could be a top 25 team. I, I thought that's how good they looked to me. Um, and, again, they just beat Fresno State, who's probably fringe top 25 as well, um, you know, probably around 35 or so, realistically. Um, I, I think Minnesota was looked pretty solid in week one, week two. I didn't get to see any of it and obviously heard about Rodney Smith being out for the year, which, again, is terrible. But the news is that he is looking for a medical redshirt to have a sixth season um and there's it doesn't seem like there's any reason he won't be granted that um because of how early this injury happened but i guess i won't speculate too much further but he's looking to return next yeah year. don't assume anything from the ncaa youngster yeah <laughs> don't don't assume a darn thing from that organization. <laughs> i mean you and i sit here and look and say yeah this should this kid should be granted a medical red shirt for what happened, but here's where you're going to run into a problem. He's already a fifth year senior. Yeah. Are they going to give him another year? That's the problem you run into. They've already, he already red shirted one year, right? I know right. it's a medical red shirt and it's totally different, but you don't know what the NCAA is thinking. You better catch him on a good day. You have to remember, I coached in the NCAA for four years and I, I hated having to deal anything. With the NCAA regulations, I mean, I did, but I hated having to deal with them. Uh, I never had to talk directly to the NCAA, but, man, uh, the things I heard in the conference, the things I heard from other coaches, it just they're so inconsistent. It's like, any, it's like any league, though, Kevin. You get your inconsistencies. And so whatever yep. their rhyme or reason is, it is what it is. I just wanted to throw that in there. Don't assume anything with this kid. Yeah, I hear you. Good point. Um, in 2016, just so people know, uh, he had almost 1,200 yards rushing, 16 touchdowns on the ground, um, and this year he was looking really good as well for P.J. Flex, second year at Minnesota. So, they, again, just depressing <laughs> if you're a Minnesota fan, realistically. Um, I will say this, though. Bryce Williams stepped in, um, and he looked pretty solid. For them, um, he is, I think he's a junior, I believe. No, he's a freshman. Okay, I don't know who I was thinking of there. Um, yeah, the freshman tailback basically going to take the load now for Minnesota. Um, I, I think they've got an injured running back who's coming back, who's a senior. Uh, but in any case, <clears throat> um, that's uh, that's where Minnesota's at right now. Uh, terrible to see and hear, but tis football. Uh, injuries happen. <laughs> Not not much else to say there. Um, so to move on, recapping games. Um, you said Troy, you wanted to save Penn State Pitt for last. I will do that for you. Ohio State and Rutgers. Um, I want to say this. Uh, I am again. Uh, I am an Ohio State football fan. So take my words with a grain of salt. But you know Troy that I don't think the world of the Titans football. I don't think the world of Duke basketball. I don't think the world of the Celtics in the NBA, just because I like a team. I don't certainly think the world of the White Sox. Um, just because I like a team doesn't mean I'm unrealistic about it. But for the listeners that don't know, again, I'm an Ohio State fan, so what I say can mean absolutely nothing to you. But I am very critical of the teams I like, probably overcritical, because I watch them too much and I diagnose the real issues that are with the team. But in any case, Ohio State, Rutgers, and again, this is Rutgers. Last week was Oregon State. They put up 77 points. This week, Rutgers, Ohio State wins 52-3. to 
I mean, that, that's what you basically expect. But it's the way they're doing it that is different to me. At least it, maybe that's you have to be a knowledgeable Ohio State fan and to watch every single play and to understand that Ohio State's offense looks, to me, this offense looks as good as it ever has, ever. And I'm, you know, 27 years old, so uh, don't, I guess, uh, consider this Ohio State's best offense ever in program history. But since I've been watching them for the last 20 years, realistically, I'm um, not going to say that I knew my stuff when I was five years old, but this is as explosive an offense as capable of a passing offense um, since Troy Smith had San Antonio Holmes and Ted Ginn Jr. and Chris Gamble, and he had a number of weapons on the outside. Uh, that team could throw the football. Uh, Troy Smith could throw the football. He was a backup in the NFL. I don't know if he's still in the NFL or not. He backed up Joe Flacco for a long time. Um, but that Ohio State offense was really good. This one with Dwayne Haskins, and he can throw the ball like an NFL quarterback. And they returned their last, their top seven receivers from a year ago. You got your two top, top two backs from a year ago back. Uh, they're absolutely loaded, and their offensive line is huge and really good. And there was some analyst, and again, it's it's an analyst, so take it for what it's worth. But he's like, this is the best offense I've seen in college football in <laughs> I, I don't know how long. Uh, and just talking about in general, not just Ohio State, but how complete this offense looks right now is. It, it looks as good as a college offense can look. <laughs> um, again, I'm an Ohio State fan, so take it for what it is. But I, I seriously think if Ohio State were to run the table and run into Alabama in the title game, anything can happen there. Um, but that's almost what I would favor to happen for Ohio State right now, just based on how good they look. I know, though, Troy, it's Oregon State and Rutgers. So I'm getting ahead of myself, but the way they look – to me is just it's a different level from what they've been in quite some time well they look good you know and like we said they probably actually upgraded at quarterback yeah so i i will say this and i will agree with you it's it's still kind of preseason cupcake it's rutgers and let's see what they do against the dominant pass rush and see if they can right. maneuver uh, amongst the you know some of the teams that are going to bring the pressure and have decent secondary play But, no, you're absolutely right. You can't take anything away from the way that they look. I mean, you can learn stuff from blowout games. I mean, we haven't talked about Wisconsin yet, but I'll kind of preface that. Since you're the Ohio State guy, I'm the Wisconsin guy. Like you said, we're we're more critical of the teams that we like on this show just because we watch so much of it. And so what did I learn from Wisconsin putting a whooping on in week two? I didn't watch all of it, but what I learned is, Man, that offensive line, if I could swear on this show, I'd put an explicit in front of good. They're good. I don't don't care if they were playing a cupcake. I I don't know if you've watched any of the Wisconsin games, Kevin. That offensive line, it's as good as advertised. And, yes, you know what? You've got NFL linemen on that line. They they are that good. And for Jonathan Taylor, I mean, with 33 carries – uh, 200 and some yards, I mean, yeah, they're good. They're good. But, again, what I want to see is now can they do it against a dominant defense in the Big Ten? Can they do it against guys that are going to be in the pros as D linemen? We'll find out. And so that's kind of – I wanted to correlate that because our teams, two things that are going on here, you, you've got things that look good, but let's see how they look when they get tested. But right now, it's looking good, right? So we'll see what happens. It's promising. It's optimistic. At least we're not sitting here being critical about our teams, like how did you struggle against this team? How did you struggle running the ball against this team? How did you struggle passing the ball against Rutgers if you're Ohio State? We're not doing that today. And I agree with you. They, They looked very good. And here's the one thing, Kevin. Ohio State did what good teams do. They imposed their will against a lesser team, and they looked good doing it. There was no rust. They looked fluent. They're consistent. Hey, that's all you can ask for. So I wanted to throw that out there that, yeah, teams can look really good, 
But now let's see when they face up against guys that are going to also going to be playing on Sunday next, you know, in next year and the next two years. So good point, though, youngster. Yeah, uh, Rutgers is different than even Michigan. You know, and people want to crap on Jim Harbaugh and Michigan, and oh my God, they're not that great. But at the end of the day, you're playing Rashawn Gary as a D tackle, who's basically the next Aaron Donald. It, it seems like he's going to be a top five pick in the draft. So it's like, yeah, it's different when you play Rutgers and when you play Michigan. You're going to have a pass rush right up the middle multiple times when you play against Michigan, no matter who you are, even Wisconsin, who's got arguably three first-round talents on the offensive line. Rashawn Gary will still get pressure on Hornibrook multiple times, guaranteed. He's that good. Nick Bosa for Ohio State is that good. Wisconsin's offensive line against Michigan. Wisconsin's offensive line against Ohio State at times will open up huge holes for Jonathan Taylor. It'll happen during some points. Wisconsin's O-line is not going to demolish Ohio State's D-line, just and vice versa. You know, same thing with Michigan and Rashawn Gary. He's not going to completely control a game, you know, but he will make impact plays. Um, that's just what the superstars at, you know, college will do. They will impose their will on certain plays, and that's like, oh, my God. <laughs> that's that's uh, for sure NFL player right there. Um, but, yeah, that's that's obviously all I have on Ohio State. Wisconsin's the next game I was going to mention. Um, it took them a while. They were only up 10 to seven at half, but then they exploded. Um, so I, I think Hornybrook threw a pick. Wow. Think, so, so similar to last year. So similar. Wisconsin struggles out of the gate and then second half imposes their will. All correct right. football youngster. That's what yeah. it is. See, the thing is I wasn't even worried at halftime when I saw the right. score. I'm like, now that offensive line is going to beat down their defensive line. Yeah. And I know Jonathan Taylor had to stay in the game probably longer than Paul Christ wanted, but that's Wisconsin football. They they try to keep it close, and then, then they're going to possess the ball, and they're going to wear you down on offense because those big, burly offensive linemen are going to beat your defensive line to the ground. You're, they're going to pancake your linebackers, and they're going to let Jonathan Taylor run, run, run. And the thing, if if you're not a Wisconsin fan, you haven't watched much Wisconsin, and if you are a Wisconsin fan, you'll you'll know, and this will this will sound familiar. Jonathan Taylor six yards. Jonathan Taylor six yards. Jonathan Taylor five yards. Jonathan Taylor four yards. Oh, Jonathan Taylor sixty five yards. That's the way that it works. And Paul Christ is going to play football that way, and I'm okay with it. it I, I'm okay with it. I I am very happy with it. But you know, Kevin, you know. That might be why they fell in the poll, because they struggled in the first half. But sometimes I don't think these voters understand the culture of every one of the teams in the top ten. Every team right. has a culture. Every team has a culture. So I, I want to throw that out there. I've got nothing else to say about Wisconsin. I'm looking at the time. I know you've got some commitments. So I'm going to try to limit my interruptions to as few as possible. Carry on, my friend. It's all good. Um, just wanted to mention this, too. 253 yards on 33 carries. That's a new career high for Jonathan Taylor, and I guarantee you that won't be his career high when he leaves Wisconsin. <laughs> He'll run for 300 in one game. I, I know it's going to happen at some point. Um, moving on, Michigan State at Arizona State. Uh, I guess I'm not going in chronological order here. I don't know what order I'm going in. Um, I'm just going through my little notes here. Um, Michigan State. Arizona State, like I mentioned during the top 25 poll for the AP, the newest one for week three, Michigan State lost 16-13. to They had a 13-3 and lead going into the fourth quarter. Um, it, in general, I think we talked about this, Troy, before the game started, that at Arizona State, 10.45 at night, the travel time, the heat, it was over 100 degrees on the field. Even at 10.45 p.m., it was over 100 degrees on the field. I mean, that's insane. Like in Florida, it's like, okay, it's 90 degrees. It feels like 105 during the day. At least at night, like it doesn't feel like 100. That's crazy. That's not, you, I, you know what, I, youngster? I worked for a company in Phoenix, and I had to go there every couple of months. Yeah. And I worked for Grand, well, I'll say it, I worked for Grand Canyon University. I was an outside uh, rep, and I went to high schools and talked to teachers about continuing education. And so I was on campus every time we went down there. And their soccer field was turf. Can you imagine the heat with turf? Yeah. I walked across it because I wanted to, 
And by the time I walked from sideline to sideline, my shirt was drenched, and I was just walking. <laughs> the heat comes off. It doesn't matter what kind of turf it is, but the heat actually comes off the turf. And, you know, like you said, even at night, I mean, I, I was unbearable walking. I can't imagine playing in those temperatures. I mean, it's yeah. got to affect you, but at the end of the day, both teams got to play in it. Right. And so we look at this. My little quick take on this game, 16 to 13, wow. It's like they forgot how to play offense because Arizona State usually can score points. And I'm not going to give credit to Michigan State's defense. I'm going to tell you this, Kevin. After two games, uh, I'm not impressed with Michigan State. No. I, thought they'd be a lot, I thought they'd be a lot better after last year. Now, I'm not at the point where I'm going to yell, fire D'Antonio, but I'm not impressed. I thought they would be a lot better after last year and after two games, and I know it's early in the season. I'm just not impressed with Michigan State, and to be honest, I'm surprised they're still in the top 25. I know they're 25. Yeah. I would have dropped them out. After yep. week one and then a loss at Arizona State, I know it was a close one, but to be honest, Kevin, Arizona State, I know it was a road game, but Michigan State – if they're supposed to be this 10-win team, they should right. have won that game by, by double digits. Yep. Should have. If they're a top 25 team and if they're a top 15 team where they started this season, they yep. should have beaten by double digits. And they didn't. I'm not impressed with Michigan State. Carry on. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, the leading rusher in this game came from Arizona State's running back who had 27 yards rushing. I mean, I, I've talked about this a number of times with L.J. Scott, the senior running back at Michigan State, who looks so great as a freshman, has just disappointed ever since. Seven carries, 19 yards. I mean, it, it's like I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I don't know if the offensive line, I don't watch Michigan State in depth enough to really give my analysis on it, but it, it's <laughs> something's not right there. And I don't know if it's offensive line play. I don't know if L.J. Scott just got worse over his career at Michigan State. But if that's the case, then where's your next really solid back? Because D'Antonio seems to always have a really solid back. But for the last three years, that's not really been the case. He hasn't had a guy who can take it 25 times and get you 100-plus yards and control a game. It just hasn't been there. And I know last year they you know, turned the record around immensely, um, and it was a great coaching job. But this year we talked about it before the year started, too, that Michigan State and their schedule was not Cupcake City. And even this game, we knew it wasn't a cupcake. You know, it, it was going to be a little difficult. Should they have won if you're a top 15, top 25 team? Absolutely. But they didn't. They're not winning the close games like they were a year ago. I mean, it, it's almost that simple. Um, we're only two weeks in. They're the number 25 team in the country. We'll see as the year goes on, but their schedule is not very easy. <laughs> um, that's life in the Big Ten. But to move on, Michigan played Western Michigan, and some of these games, uh, it's going to be like, uh, okay, whatever. Um, but that's, uh, that's going to be the case for a lot of week three previews. Um, that part of the show is going to go by very quickly. Michigan hosted Western Michigan. They won 49-3. to I have nothing to really – say about this other than, hey, you played Western Michigan and P.J. Flex not there and Corey Davis isn't there and a solid quarterback isn't there. So it's really just Western Michigan. I mean, it's nothing special. Michigan should have dominated. They did. Shea Patterson looked really good because he actually had time, unlike against Notre Dame. Um, Karan Higdon looked really good on the ground, as he should, because the offensive line dominated. The defensive line dominated. Uh, there's nothing more for me to say anyway. Good job, Wolverines. That's all I got. Yeah. Northwestern hosted Duke. We had Northwestern minus three as the go big or go home lock of the week. Oh, they lost oh the really? There was no scoring in the game in the second half, which is, <laughs> I don't know if that was Ravens, 2000 Ravens versus 85 Bears or what happened there, but Duke Northwestern, no scoring in the second half. It was 21 to seven and a half, no scoring. That's it. Done. Uh, my overall take for Northwestern, though, quarterback Clayton Thorson, who is recovering from a torn ACL, who has been playing this year, um, obviously not as effective. He didn't seem perfectly right in week one and obviously did not in week two. 
Um, they play a couple quarterbacks. They have the first couple weeks for a reason because Thorson's not 100%. Um, I, I would just let him sit. <laughs> um, that's just me until he's truly ready to go. But the other note I wanted to make is that, yes, Northwestern lost by 14 to Duke at home. Um, but last year they had Justin Jackson, the program's leading rusher. We've talked about him a number of times on the show. He graduated, went to the NFL. And Jeremy Larkin stepped in now as a sophomore. In the first couple of games, again, Northwestern lost. They scored seven points. But Larkin has looked really good. Um, it, he's going to be there for at least the next two years. And that's he's going to be their bread and butter. That's who Northwestern is going to give the ball more often than not. Um, yeah, that, that, that's all I got. Uh, I'm impressed with Larkin stepping up as a running back. Um, otherwise, not impressed with Northwestern whatsoever. Obviously, the quarterback is not at 100% after tearing his ACL on last year's bulk. Well, the problem with college athletics, youngster, is that you've got to force people back from injury sooner than you'd want to because all the games matter, right? Yeah. you got 13 games. Right. Everyone, everyone matters. You, you don't have the luxury to sit a guy. And, you know, I kind of j- joked about, well, it's Duke. It's not Duke basketball. But Duke is an average team at best, Kevin. And if you struggle Duke. at home uh, against an average football team, you got problems. Uh, yeah. Again, are they anomalies? Well, we'll see. But like you said, if your quarterback's not 100% healthy, how do you risk putting him out there against the Duke? I mean, I, I should feel confident enough where I don't need to have my quarterback trying to possibly, you know, suffer a setback after a surgery against the Duke. I should have confidence in my backup quarterback to go out there against Duke. And, and here's the thing I don't get, Kevin, is you look at this Northwestern team, and it's a team that can run the ball. You would have thought that they would have just tried to obliviate Duke with the run. And yeah. again, I didn't sit and watch every snap of this game. And Duke, I, I'll give my, my hats off to them. They, they went out, they played a game, they beat Northwestern. That's a huge win for them to get a win against a Big Ten team. But that's all i got to say is Wolverines, you pooed the bed. You ruined our perfect, perfect lock predictions. Way to go, Wildcats. Not real happy with you right now. No, not me either. Uh, Larkin had 24 carries, 121 yards, a touchdown. But it, that, that was it. I mean, it, it didn't result in more than that one touchdown in the first quarter. Yeah, the to touchdown the... came on the first drive, Kevin. Yeah. Came on the first drive. It, yeah, stat-wise, he averaged five yards a carry, had 24 carries. I, it, it seemed like he had a good game statistically, and I watched some of it, and he did. He looked good, but it just never ended up in points. That's, that, that's, that's all I got on that. Carry on. Purdue hosted Eastern Michigan, and Purdue was supposed to win the game, but they didn't again. They're 0-2 now after losing to Eastern Michigan. 20 to 19, they lost on a last second field goal. Um, Eastern Michigan has a former Iowa Hawkeye who transferred as their quarterback. He played pretty well, um, but he transferred from Iowa for a reason. Um, and Purdue should have won this game at home. They didn't. And the only thing I'm going to mention on it is they still play two quarterbacks, basically 50 percent of the time. It's not working. That's it. That's all I got. Yeah, it's not working. That's all I got, too. We, we mentioned this, and we sound like broken records talking about it. It's, it's okay if you have a, a sequence or a set of plays for a, a second quarterback, but you need to name a starter. You need to get somebody that's fluent in the game, and this whole, well, we're going to see you as the hot hand, to me it doesn't work. you got to have a starter, a guy that prepares, and then if you want to put in – some plays for a second quarterback, that's fine. Certain down and distance, even a couple drives. Like, hey, guess what? Uh, we think it's about time that we're going to put this in and then have the plays scripted, almost like a lot of teams do in the beginning of the game. They script their first 15 plays. Hey, we've got two drives scripted, and we're going to use them at certain points in the game 
maybe when we need a boost, maybe when we need to control the clock, maybe when we need ultimately need a score, that I think would be okay. But the way they're doing it right now, Kevin, doesn't work. That's all I got. Yeah, it's like, hey, this guy's going to play in the first quarter, the other guy's going to play in the second quarter, and then we'll see what happens. It's like, what do you mean? What, what do you mean you're going to play someone in the first quarter and then sit them in the second quarter automatically? They're having a good game and you're going to sit them just because? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. Um, the only thing that pops into my mind as two quarterback systems working, and you mentioned it, exactly how it would work, is Chris Leak and Tim Tebow at Florida. Chris Leak was the starter. He was the starting quarterback. He threw it. Tim Tebow would throw it probably three times a game, but he was in there to run the ball basically on third and one. And in goal line situations, he'd be there because he was an extra threat at the goal line. That was it. They knew their roles. They prepared accordingly, and they were really good at their roles, and they won a national title. That's the only way it works. Otherwise, don't do it. (laughs) That's simple to me. Um, Moving on to a uh, somewhat good story, somewhat bad story, um, but Nebraska finally played a game. Um, and week one was postponed. Week two, Scott Frost, Nebraska debut. Everyone was excited to see it, and Nebraska hosted Colorado and lost the game. Unfortunately, it was 33-28. to 28. They lost it, like, in the final minute. Um, quarterback Adrian Martinez is, again, I mentioned to fans a week ago, I mentioned on Twitter even, before the game started, watch this game for Nebraska's offense because it's going to be fun to watch, and it was. Uh, when Adrian Martinez was healthy, he ended up getting hurt. He's supposed to be, it's kind of a day-to-day thing. It's not a long-term injury, but maybe that's what comes with running the ball 15 times for 117 yards and two touchdowns as a true freshman quarterback um, in Scott Frost's system is that you're going to get nicked up a little bit because of how many carries you have and how much you're going to get hit inevitably. Um, so that's something, I guess, to monitor going forward. But He is electrifyingly fast. He has an arm. He's not just a pure runner. Um, He is a legitimate college quarterback, for sure. Um, And he's very exciting with his feet. And finally, Troy, I know you're going to like this. I don't know if you saw any of the Nebraska game or not. Uh, We talk about it with Iowa, and it's like, what's your identity? What are you trying to do? And if you watch this game and you watch Nebraska on offense, they snap the ball every 15 seconds. You knew exactly what Adrian Martinez could do. Yeah, my dog apparently loves the doorbell. But Nebraska offensively has an identity. You know they're going to spread you out. They're going to be fast. They're going to be up-tempo. Their quarterback can run the football. Their quarterback can throw the football. They're looking to spread the field and be more athletic than you and go really up-tempo and tire your D-line out. And that's what Scott Frost is bringing to Nebraska. And it's an identity. And it's a little different to the Big Ten, um, but he goes up-tempo. And that quarterback can absolutely fly, and it's fun to watch. So, and it's yes, totally it's- different from Nebraska football of old. It's totally different from when Frost played at Nebraska. But I'll tell you what, we mentioned on this show, or at least I mentioned, that don't overlook Colorado going to Nebraska. That's a decent football team. It's a rival game. And Colorado could win that game. And they did. Yeah. Do, do you sit there and say, oh, my God, Nebraska, you should have won this game. I didn't think Nebraska, you know, was hands down going to win that game. Yeah. Uh, Colorado's decent. But like yeah. you said, what you took away from Nebraska is interesting to see Scott Frost in his first game, first loft in umpteen years. Well, you went undefeated last year. So in one year. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. That was my takeaway from this game, Kevin. Watch out for Nebraska because they've now got a system. They've got a style of play, unlike last year when you're like, what is Nebraska? Right. What do they bring to the table? Now you know. Now they're going to come and play. Are they going to win 10 games? Probably not. But are they going to be competitive? Yeah, they certainly are. That's all I got. I'm looking at the time, youngster. Keep flying. One thing I want to mention, too, and people or the one of the commentators mentioned this, LaVisca Chenault Jr., the wide receiver for Colorado. If you watch this game, you inevitably know who he is now. Uh, he, they called him a mini Julio Jones because he's like two inches shorter. It, he looks like Julio freaking Jones. I mean, he, was, he's, <laughs> he looked like a first-round NFL pick. 
and he's a sophomore at Colorado. I mean, this, this is not a senior at Texas Tech who went to Texas Tech because he knows he's going to get 15 catches a game, or he's, you know, at Alabama, you know, being the next Julio Jones. But he went to Colorado, and he's a sophomore. But he looks freaking – he was impressive. I mean, he was easily the best player on the field, and it's a wide receiver from Colorado. I mean, he was freaking good. I mean, I, I'm excited if any Big Ten team – Hey, youngster, you're getting really worked up because you usually don't throw the, the, the freaking word out there. No. Holy no, cow. I, I don't. You must really be impressed <laughs> with this kid. He looked really good. I, I I haven't seen a college wide receiver look like that since uh, it's been a couple of years. Like Calvin Ridley looks good at Alabama. Um, Julio Jones stood out at Alabama. Uh, Michael Crabtree at Texas Tech stood out to me. Uh, I remember Calvin Johnson a long time ago at Georgia Tech. He stood out. Um, this kid stood out. I mean, he's. I'd be surprised if he's not a first round pick in 2020. I guess is what it would be. So nothing to look forward to too soon, but he looked really good. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so I was happy to see that from Nebraska. That's my overall takeaway. Obviously, Martinez getting hurt sucks, and if he's out for a couple of weeks, that sucks. But <laughs> I, I was glad to see Nebraska have an identity. Moving on, Iowa hosted Iowa State. Iowa won the game 13-3. The offense – was not that good for the second straight week, and the offense was supposed to be pretty good coming into this year. People liked quarterback Nate Stanley. People liked their tight ends. Um, their tight ends have played well, but Nate Stanley has not played well. The running game hasn't done well. The defense, however, has done well the first two weeks. That's why they're 2-0. That's why they kept Iowa State, who's pretty decent as well, uh, to three points. Uh, that was impressive. I didn't see much of the game at all, but – to hold Iowa State to three points is impressive. Uh, the defense has looked good. The offense has not. That's been the story for Iowa thus far. I've got nothing more to add on it. Rival game. I said it would be a good one. I didn't think it would be a. I didn't think it would be a snoozer. Thirteen to three. If you like defense, it was it was a game to watch. But yeah, you give credit to Iowa's defense, Kevin. Iowa State's no slouch. I mentioned it. You know throw the records away it's like the Bears Packers Vikings Vikings Packers you know Steelers Bengals it's a rival game and Iowa State's not a terrible team they're going to go out and they're going to play so yeah I mean uh, Iowa can do it on defense but I mean to be honest offensively you've mentioned it a million times on this show Kevin you got to have offense to win in college if you ultimately want to win You've got to have an above-average offense if you want to make noise in college football. That's all I got. I don't think anyone holds Alabama to 21 points or fewer. I think Alabama scores 24-plus in every single game. I think Ohio State scores 24-plus in every single game. You're not going to just straight up shut down the top teams and win a college football title. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> that That's any year. That's not just this year. That's, you know. In any year, um, that's that's college football for you. But so your offense has to do something. <laughs> They've got to do something well. Um, but to move on, um, the most of these are going to be pretty boring going forward. We already talked about Minnesota Fresno State. Um, I have nothing on that outside of the injury and Bryce Williams stepping up as a freshman running back to take Rodney's best place. Um, that's that game. Minnesota won that one, twenty-one fourteen. Um, I don't know if you've got anything on that, Troy, but I'll move on to the next one. Good Maryland, job, Yeah. <laughs> Maryland at Bowling Green. Maryland won 45-14, just like Wisconsin did. They trailed 14-10 to 10 at half, and then they won the second half 35-0. Um, Maryland it should beat Bowling Green. I've Good got job, nothing Terrapin. more. Yep. <laughs> Indiana hosted Virginia. Indiana won the game 20-16. to 16. Um, that, that was a game that Troy and I thought could go either way, and Indiana won a close one. Um, they lost the second half seven to nothing, as odd as that is. Um, they purely won the game in the first half. I'll say this too: Peyton Ramsey, the quarterback, he was efficient, and this freshman running back they have, Stevie Scott, uh, 31 carries, 204 yards, a touchdown. That's 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 impressive for a freshman. Um, that's like Jonathan Taylor numbers. <laughs> from a year ago. 
Um, not to say he's Jonathan Taylor, not to say Indiana's going to be Wisconsin, but maybe they've got something in this kid. Um, played really well the first two weeks, but we'll see as the competition stiffens. Um, anything you got on that, Troy? No, I mean, for the Indiana program, though, it's good to get a win. Uh, I know it's Virginia. They're not as dominant, uh, you know, in the world of college football. But for Indiana to, to get an early win, uh, you know, went through a little bit of adversity in this game, you know, not scoring in the second half, having to hold off Virginia, uh, good for them. I mean, we do a Big Ten show. We, we don't wish bad on any team. Even though I'm a Badger guy, you're a Buckeye guy, we do the show. We want all teams to be good, uh, yep. really. When, you, when you're a – you want every team in that conference to be good because then all the games are meaningful. And if yeah. you look at it as a conference as a whole, you don't want teams to suck. Right. Because if in they the suck, end, it helps your team. Yeah. yeah, it does. Because if they're good and you win, then – their strength of schedule looks good to the voters. When they can go top to bottom and say, man, even the worst team in the Big Ten is good, I mean, it's not going to probably happen like that, but if they can say, hey, the, the ninth team in the Big Ten is really is not bad. Right. You know, they're, yep. they're pretty good. That is good for the conference. So I'm happy for Indiana, Kevin, to get an early win. And against Virginia, again, no slouch. Virginia's no slouch. You had to play, so good job, Indiana. Way to go. Carry on. Yep. Last one, Illinois hosted Western Illinois. Western Illinois is, I think, an FCS school. Um, they won 34-14, to 14, whatever. Freshman quarterback MJ Rivers, they've been using the senior, A.J. Bush. Um, and, again, it's only week two. But this freshman came in and played pretty well, threw a couple touchdowns, ran for 36 yards. Could be the future quarterback of Illinois for the next few years. Um, so, it, I guess, intriguing to see if you're an Illinois fan. Obviously, you should beat an FCS school, which they did. That is it for week two. We can preview week three very quickly, unless you've got anything more to add on Illinois, Troy. Well, we we didn't talk about Penn State. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Now Penn State I, again, at Pitt. I, yeah, Penn State Pitt. at Pitt. And I know I know you got your other – got your new gig, so we, we can't stay on the line too long. Um, we'll save this conversation. Just make a, make a note, Kevin. Next week, I want to talk about the state of, Pitt, of the state of Pitt football after getting demolished by Pitt. Um, there's some things I want to talk about, and it's going to warrant more than a five or ten minute conversation. But Penn okay. State, this was one of those games where they didn't look really good against Appalachian State in Week One, and then people are going, "Well, they lost all these players. They lost Barkley. Blah blah blah." This was basically Penn State coming out and saying, you're nowhere near our talent level. Look right. what we have. Now, this game, this, this game to me, Troy, Troy, this game to me showed at the final score, it's like, yeah, Penn State has top five recruiting classes every year now. But that's, that's what this was. Because they're super young, but it didn't matter. They still won 51-6. to six. Yeah. <laughs> that's and there's some things I really want to get into, but again, I know that you've got some commitments that you've got to get off to. But this is Penn State. You know, we've talked about Penn State, how they're in right now where their program is at. They're in a lose and re- reload mode. They're not in, hey, we've got to rebuild for two years. They're right. at the point. They've had enough success where they next man up, and not in a bad way. They're going out and they're able to recruit, like you said, four or five-star recruits. So when they lose a Barkley to the NFL, there's a running back sitting on that roster that's ready to prove his point and go out there and be good. And you've got McSorley at quarterback. When McSorley's gone, Franklin's got that program set up where he's going to have a talented kid come in. Are they young? Yes. Are they going to make mistakes? Yes. But are they talented? Yes. And pure talent in college football, Kevin, can win games alone. doesn't have to be the best scheme in the world. When, you, when you're position for position and more talented, that can just win you a game that way because you're better than your opponent. And that's where Penn State's at. That's all I want to say on Penn State. Again, I've got a bigger point that I want to bring up, and we'll do that next week, youngster. Sounds good. 
Um, previewing week three, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag here, um, partially because it'll make it go a little quicker. <laughs> but I there was no game where I wanted to lock in a go big or go home lock of the week this week. That's just me. I will tell you the lines, Troy, and obviously. Well, the then what, what we got there, youngster, is no locks because it has to be a mutual agreement. And if you're not willing to lock any games, no go big or go home lock this week, folks. No. Let's go over the games Sorry. quickly, and if I if I have an intriguing one, uh, I'll just interrupt you like I'm good at. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Penn State at home against Kent State. Penn State minus 35. Again, it's one of those games. Could they win by 42? Could they win by 31? Sure. Could go either way. Penn State at home against Kent State. Obviously, Penn State's going to kill them. You got anything, Troy? Nope. And here's the thing. I, if I have anything, I'll, I'll just blurt something out. But to okay. be honest, the schedule this week to me, ah, it's still Big Ten, so I'll be interested. I'll watch. But nothing where I've got my DVR set. Yeah. This one's somewhat interesting to me, but it, in a bad way. Uh, Rutgers plus two and a half at Kansas. Do you know the last time, Troy, Kansas was favored at home against a Power 5 school? Do you know what year it was? Was it before I was born? <laughs> it's not. It's not that far. Uh, Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Yeah. Nine years ago, Kansas was favored against the Power Five school. That's insane. That speaks to how bad Kansas football is, and they're the team that I always bring up for Power Five school that's bad at football. Kansas football that takes the cake. They're favored to beat Rutgers, and I would like to take Rutgers here. Um, I I honestly do think Rutgers will win. I'm not going to lock it in, but I would pick Rutgers on the points if I had to pick it. They're plus two and a half. Um, Basically win the game and you win the bet. Um, I I, I think Rutgers is better. I think the quarterback they have, the true freshman they have, um, he's actually talented. And I think Rutgers will win the game. Um, The 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 odds makers are looking at what happened at Penn State, Kevin. That's what they're looking at. Rutgers coming off that blowout. So and they're looking at Rutgers football. That's why right. that's why they're they're the underdog. But I'm with you. Uh, I would actually, I know you're not locking it in, but an old man will lock it in. Rutgers should go to Kansas and win. Again, yeah. we we think Rutgers is an okay football team. They're, they're not a great team. I wouldn't even, I don't even want to say they're an average team, but they're okay. They can play at times. Now, again, they have to travel, so it's a road game. But Rutgers has opportunities to play good football. And I think they're just inconsistent right now. That program's never going to be that, that consistent top 10 program. But I like what Rutgers puts on the field this year. I just, you know, what I've seen in, you know, two weeks, you ran up against Penn State. Yeah. You're, you're over, overmatched from the top of your roster to the bottom of your roster. You're overmatched against Penn State. Against Kansas, they should go out and be able to play. Uh, I like Rutgers. I, I would, if I had, if I was doing a pool, I would pick Rutgers. Would you be willing to make it the lock of the week, Troy? Because I'm down right now. I'm, I'm down to switch my vote. I would, I would lock it in. I don't want to be the one. I don't want to be the one. But, I mean, Kevin, t- just take a look at it. You got Kansas. I mean, it is that Kansas stuff. And Rutgers I don't has care. to travel to play on the road. I don't I care. like Rutgers. I, I'm, I wouldn't even think that they're going to lose this game. I think Rutgers yeah. has – the, the odds makers are looking at them getting blown out by Penn State, but do you know how much Rutgers actually probably learned? Yeah. Did they get embarrassed? Yeah. So guess what? As a former college coach, when my teams got embarrassed, there was no pouting in the locker room. I would go around and say, what did you learn today? Well, we've got to get better at this, Coach. We've got to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got your butt whooped. Now, how are we gonna how are we gonna go out there so this doesn't happen again? And I think you're gonna see a Rutgers team go go to Kansas, play better, play good football, and come out of Kansas with a win. Yeah, yep. I'm I would lock it, youngster. All right, we're we're locking it in. So scratch scratch what we just talked about about how now there's no lock of the week because there is. I I changed my mind. I like Rutgers to win the game. You're willing to lock it in, so why not? Let's do it. 
Rutgers plus two and a half at Kansas. Um, I will make a note in the show bio, and obviously we will keep track for next week. Indiana minus 14 and a half versus Ball State. Uh, Indiana will beat Ball State at home. That's just the way it is. Maryland minus 15 and a half at home against Temple. Maryland will win that game. Nebraska minus 11 and a half against Troy at home. Nebraska is the more talented team. I hope Adrian Martinez is healthy for this game, but even if he isn't, they're more talented than Troy. You know what, Kevin? I I just mentioned it before with Northwestern. Martinez is your future. If he's not 100%, don't even play him. Don't even play him. I know he's a young kid and he needs reps, but do not sacrifice the future for one game against Troy. I mean, that would be ridiculous in my mind. If I turn that game on, Kevin, and I see him out there limping around, (laughs) I I will be swearing at Scott Frost on the TV. Why? Why would you do that? The kid proved against Colorado how good he is. Yeah. The way that you run your offense, and he's going to take another hit? Uh Uh-uh. I sit him unless he is 150%. Like, better than he was in week one before the game started. Because I'm not sacrificing the leader of my team against Troy. I'm sorry. I had to get worked up at some point on the show, youngster. There we go. Almost the finale. Wisconsin minus 21.5 at home against BYU. BYU last year did not finish 500, over 500, for the first time in a long time. Um, it, BYU is usually pretty respectable. They're not really. Uh, their quarterback, Tanner Magnum, if he's actually healthy finally, um, it, they could move the ball up and down the field, but Wisconsin's favored by three touchdowns for a reason. I'm not willing to block in anyway. Um, it, either way there. No, right. no lock on this youngster because, as I mentioned before, Wisconsin is going to struggle against BYU in the first half. I wouldn't be surprised if I'm sitting here on Saturday and Wisconsin's losing at halftime. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprised. It's just the way that they play football. They're, yep. Every, every team knows what Paul Christ is going to do, and you got no real threat at quarterback with Hornybrook. So what are you going to try to do in the first half? You're going to try to stop the run against that mammoth offensive line. You're going to put eight or nine in the box. Paul Christ is stubborn. He's going to keep running the ball, and it's going to result in punts. It's going to result in keeping a really low-scoring first half, and then in the second half, the mammoth men up front are going to wear down BYU, and then Jonathan Taylor is going to burst out after averaging, you know what, five yards a carry? Boom, 70-yard touchdown run. That's what's going to happen. So I'm not, I would not lock in anything over 14 with the Badgers, anything over 10 with the Badgers, and they're giving 21 points. I might almost go the other way, but I'm not going to. It's just I know Wisconsin football. But could they win by 21? They could win by 35 if they go out and pound the ball and BYU can't stop the run. Right. So this is, that's where the, that's where the I don't know what I'm going to do right now comes out. Yep. Agreed completely. Michigan at home against SMU, they're favored by 36. That'll be a joke. Minnesota is favored to beat Miami of Ohio by 13 and a half at home, um, as they should. Uh, Illinois plus 10 at home against USF. Uh, USF's the more talented team. Uh, USF should win the game. Illinois is at home. What, what does that really mean, honestly? Um, you know, a, a couple points maybe. But Illinois plus 10, uh, Illinois should lose that game. Uh, they're not as talented. Uh, Purdue plus six at home against Missouri. That's interesting, but Purdue, this two-quarterback system is just not working. So a team like Missouri, who's maybe as talented, maybe a little more talented, has to travel to Purdue. Missouri should still win because Purdue is not proving anything to this point. That's why they're 0-2. Their two-quarterback system is not working. Um, There's a couple games left, Troy, unless you've got anything to add on what I just talked about. You don't even have to ask me. I'll just interrupt you. Sounds good. Northwestern at home against Akron. Northwestern favored by 21 because Akron is Akron. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens at quarterback if Thorson's in there or not, I guess. But see a lot of Jeremy Larkin at running back. That's the goal, I think, if you're a Wildcat fan right now. Iowa at home against Northern Iowa. Northern Iowa is an FCS school, so there's no line on it. 
the last game, a Saturday night game at on ABC. Ohio State plays in Jerry's World, AT&T Stadium, so it's not literally a home game for TCU, but it's in the state of Texas. TCU will be doing just fine in terms of fanhood, um, but Ohio State fans will travel to AT&T Stadium as well. <laughs> um, Ohio State is favored in this one. TCU is ranked 15th in the country. Ohio State is favored by 13.5 points. That goes to show how much love there is going to Ohio State right now, and I agree wholeheartedly with it. Because if Ohio State lost this game to TCU in the state of Texas, I'd be pissed as an Ohio State fan. I mean, that, that's how much I like this Ohio State team this year. <laughs> Just from what I'm seeing and from what I thought Haskins would be, he's exceeding my expectations, which were very high. Coming into this year, I, they look incredibly good. They, they, they really do. And I know Alabama's got an incredibly, really good Alabama team, too. Like, it, better than probably some of the teams that have won national titles this year. That, that's how good Alabama's supposed to be this year. It, these two teams, to me, look better than anyone else. And it, not to say it's not close. Uh, Georgia's really good, too. Um, but it, Clemson kind of plays two quarterbacks right now because they've got two really good ones. Um, they're not overly dominating. Uh, Georgia looks really good. Alabama looks dominant. Ohio State looks dominant. Ohio State should go into Texas and beat TCU. And, again, I'd be upset if they lost. And it would be a big upset. It would be a two-touchdown upset. Um, That's how good Ohio State looks right now. And I think the line is perfect. Because if they won by two touchdowns, it wouldn't surprise me (laughs) at all. Um, That's how good Ohio State's looking. And, yeah, I've I've got nothing more to – to add, but <laughs> I'll, add, Ohio I'll State. add one thing. I'll add one thing, youngster. What is TCU's identity? What do they like to do offensively? Uh, they like to have a good mix <laughs> of everything. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I don't think they've got anyone super special doing anything right now. I think they've got uh, they're the number fifteen team in the country for a reason. Uh, they're going to be really strong, but. They're a really good team going up against a team that can win a national title. That's the difference here. And what do we always say is a big thing to win football games? You mentioned it all. Line of scrimmage? Quarterback. 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 Well, quarterback line. Yep. And, and so I like TCU. I think they're a solid football team. Yep. And – you, you may look at this Ohio State defense and say, you're talking about their offense, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, people are saying, well, they lost so-and-so, they lost so-and-so, they lost so-and-so. It's kind of like Penn State. They lose and they reload. They don't retool. They lose players and then they retool. They just put them in the line. Now, is this defensive line better than last year's? No. Is it still a top line in the country defensively yes i don't think tcu is going to face another line like this for no. a long time and tcu is built to offensively that's what they're going to do they're not known for their defense but this game is going to be one kevin to me by ohio State. defense you like their offense you said hey they're clicking like they never have before one of the best offenses I'm an old guy. I think games are won by defense, and that's what you're going to see when you watch this game on Saturday night. You're going to see a Big Ten Ohio State defense dominate TCU. Now, again, in college, good offenses are going to score points even against a great defense. And Ohio State's going to give up some points. But Ohio State is going to pressure TCU. They're going to force turnovers. I wouldn't lock the line. I mean, it's still going to be a competitive game because TCU is a top top 25 team. But I just think Ohio State's defense is way too much for that TCU offense. That's all I got. And I think the offense is going to be too much for the defense. <laughs> so we like different dominating Ohio State aspects of this game. Um, that's it. That's that's all the games. I, I saved the night special for last. Um, I I'm head over heels for this Ohio State team as everyone can notice by listening to the show. So that's it. I'm done. Yeah, and I'm glad that you stayed past your deadline you gave me because I always like doing the show with you. 
So for yeah, those that have me as well. Not, not that long of a show, actually. If you think about it, it's just an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. Find us on Twitter, at TroyRobert967 is the old man. The youngster is at Kid Cunny, K-I-D-C-U-N-I. But make sure you follow our Twitter handle for our show, at Youngster Old Man. Not only for Go Big or Go Home, but for all the radio stuff that we do. Have a good day, everybody. The Youngster and I will get back with you next week. Go Big Ten. Go Rutgers.